Oh. That's all right. Yeah, give us, a, give us an A for effort anyway. We'll practice it and sing it next time. She was going to sing a special by herself. So next time I preach, she'll do that. Won't you, honey? Sure you will. All right, next time, next time. If you got your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let me get my mind straight here. While you're turning there in Romans chapter 8, we're going to be in verse 6. <clears throat> and oftentimes this is a familiar scripture, especially if you were reading the life of the Apostle Paul. Romans 6, 7, and 8, it talks about his conversion. It talks about him living for God to the best of his ability and, uh, and we find that even that powerful apostle had a struggle in the beginning, but he came to know. Amen. He came to know and walk his faith, hallelujah, like most of us do. If you want to stand with me while we read the Word, um, you know, we do that in reverence to God's Word. Yes. We don't do that because we do Pentecostal aerobics here. We just do it because we want to pay honor to the, the Lord's Word. So <clears throat> it says this, For to be carnally... Minded, or to be carnally minded, is death. But to be spiritually minded, and get this now, is life and peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you for the anointing. We thank you for your presence in this house tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the hungry people that have come tonight seeking your word. Not anything I can say or do, but Father God, your word as I'm used as a conduit tonight and use me well as I yield to your spirit in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God would say, Amen. Amen. And you may be seated in the Lord. If I was to title this message tonight, it would be called, To Be Carnally Minded. A lot of people hear that word, but they really don't understand what that word means. And in Sunday school this morning, we were kind of, kind of goofing around a little bit. And carnal, carnal, the Greek word is carne, which means meat, flesh, self-reliance. And I was doing some research on it one time, and it means when you're spiritually minded and you're carnally minded and you're carne minded, it means you're a meathead. Half of you laugh, you'll get the rest of you get it later. All right, but anyway... When we are carnally minded, it means that we are not spiritually minded. Now, come on, somebody. And, and the thing is, we're dealing with a carnal world. We're dealing with a world system that has been set up to tantalize the flesh. To literally speak to the flesh and serve the flesh. And have you ever noticed that your flesh desires that which will destroy it? Come on, somebody. The drug addict knows it very well. The very substance that they seek to have in their body is the very substance that's destroying them from within. That's a good example of carnality. You see, the church today has let too much stuff in the door. You say, oh, this is not going to be a shout me message. Oh, yes it is. Yes it is. Because if you understand what the Scripture is telling us is, is those of us that are washed in the blood of the Lamb of God and are walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, desiring the Holy Ghost in our life, we have something that the world desires to have. Oh, come on, somebody. It's true. You know it. Now, what does it mean to be carnally minded? In other words, to be carnally minded is not watching too much television or interested in sports, etc., as most Christians think and believe. But I will tell you this. You've got to go through a lot of garbage to find a good program on TV these days. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's just better to go click, shut it off, and put some worship music on. Come on, somebody. I remember when I first got saved, I got so saved that I threw my TV out the front door. I did. Right out the door it went. I didn't miss it, didn't miss it, didn't miss it until the Gulf War broke out. Then inquiry minds just got to know. 
So I went and bought another TV just to watch and see what was going on in the news. But I think it's also important that we know what's going on around us as well. And if you're in tune to the Spirit of God, you'll know exactly what's going on about you. Because the Spirit of the living God is ministering to His church daily, if not all the time, 24-7, 365. He is a communicating God, and He wants to communicate with His body. Those that said yes to Him and invited Him in, He is speaking from within. Because if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, then you have a voice that is constantly inside of you. Matter of fact, it says, and it's compared to rivers of living water that are literally gushing out of you. Hallelujah. He's speaking to you. Some call it your conscience. I call it the voice of God. Come on, somebody. We need to understand that the activities that most people count as carnal are not necessarily that. What Paul is addressing here is being carnally minded is simply placing one's faith in something other than what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You see, a lot of times we got people behind pulpits reading the Reader's Digest and passing off as gospel. Or something that will tickle your flesh. They'll sprinkle it with a little bit of scripture. But it has no spiritual substance. As a matter of fact, I believe it is in the book of Jude where it talks about wells without water and clouds without rain. There's a lot of people that get behind a pulpit with just the intention of calling it a career. I mean, this ain't a career. This is a matter of life and death. We are to be speaking the oracles of God. In other words, what the Spirit of God is speaking to the church, the minister, when he gets behind the sacred desk, our obligation is to speak what thus saith the Lord. I got two amens. All right, praise God, we're moving on. Now, for to be carnally minded, let's read that again. Is death. What's he talking about? They're dead to spiritual things. But on the other hand, if you talk about a spiritual man, I'm also a dead man walking. What do I mean by that? I'm dead to the things of the world, or I should be. I should be dead to that former conversation, those things that, that used to get me going, don't get me going anymore. I find them repulsive. I find them vile. I find them dirty. I find those things no longer pleasure me the way they used to pleasure me because I've been born again. I'm a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. I want the Holy Ghost to envelop my life in a manner that when people see me, they go, I know who He used to be. But my goodness, look who He is now. We give all praise to God Almighty for all of that. That's what we should. What the Apostle Paul is saying is there are two wills contrasted in verses 5 through 8. Let's read verses 5 through 8. Romans 8. It says, For they who are after the flesh do mind the what? The things of the flesh. But they who are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. And that's what I like about that life and peace. We need some more of that. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And what does that mean? Enmity against God. The carnal mind is enmity against God or the law of God or the Spirit of God. It means it's at war with the Spirit of God. So, for it is not subject to the law of God and neither indeed can be. In other words, it's not going to follow what God wants. Those that are carnally minded will not follow God. The will of God. Amen. Just won't do it. It's like oil and water clashing. Never will blend together. Never will. Amen. Goes on to say, So then they that are in the flesh cannot what? Please God. I don't know about you, but when I got saved, that was the main objective. Amen. Was to please God and make sure that everything I did was pleasing to God. Every decision that I made was aligned with the will of God and pleasing to God. Everything that I did in my life from therefore when I said yes to Jesus, should be pleasing to God. Notice I said should be pleasing to God. How many of us can honestly say that we have God first in every aspect of our life? Down to buying a car, down to buying a candy bar. 
Now, I'm not saying that you have to pray to God and seek God and say how, you, how rare your steak has to be before you eat it. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm saying is some people go overboard. But what I'm saying is God needs to be in, in, in first place in everything that we do. The scripture tells us that whatever we do, we do it as unto the Lord. Whatever we put our hand to. That means our jobs. That means what we do for Him in the Spirit. What we do in our family life. Everything, He needs to be first in it. Because if He's first, guess what? He's able to lead us then. And we're going to get into that. Thank you, Jesus. But you are not in the flesh. Now, who's He talking to? Those of us that are born again. We are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If it be so that the Spirit of God dwell in you, in other words, if you're truly saved. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If Christ be in you. And you notice how he's saying, if Christ be in you. The body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. In other words, right standing with God, which can only be bought and brought through the blood of Jesus Christ. And what he did on that wonderful cross. What he's done for us. Now, let me get to the last verse. But if the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of him who has raised Jesus up from the dead dwell in you, he who has raised up Christ from the dead shall also what? Quicken your mortal bodies. I like that. By his Spirit who dwells in you. It is so important saints of God, that we not fake it till we make it. We need a genuine move of God in our life. We need to be spiritually minded and not walk in carnality. Because that's only going to last for a little while. But I'm going to tell you why. Because God doesn't put up with counterfeits in His house. He doesn't put up with counterfeits anywhere close to His Word. He wants to give you genuine, a genuine move of God. He wants to minister to you in a genuine way. Hallelujah. You know, when you have a car, you want to go in and you want to buy genuine parts, don't you? You don't want to buy generic parts for your car. Next thing you know, those parts are falling off your car. Come on, somebody. If he's offering the real deal, then why would you not avail yourself to a genuine move of the Spirit in your life? But we get a lot of people that are caught up in carnality because it tantalizes and feeds their flesh. You see, we inside of us, when we got saved, we took on a divine nature. And that divine nature just literally seeks the move of the Holy Ghost. It desires to have the leading of the Holy Ghost. It, it literally desires for us to be filled and overflowing with the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the carnal will bring independent of God's will. In other words, it is hostile to it and it cannot be otherwise. Carnal spirit will lead you down the wrong road every time. We got some people in here that think they can, what do I call that? I call it fence row Christianity. They're sitting on the fence rail. They got one foot in the world and they got one foot in church. You know what that is? That's carnality. Pure and simple. You're living a double life. It's not true. There's nothing true about that. You need to be on one side of the fence or the other. You need to either say, yes, I'm born again, child of God, or I am not living for God at all. Listen. You know what a hypocrite is? Yeah, I said that word in church. Hypocrite. A lot of us need to avail ourselves to the dictionary again. A hypocrite is someone that acts like someone that they are not. And then we wonder why Hollywood people have problems. They're so busy acting like everybody else that they have forgotten who they are. Come on, somebody. And there's a lot of people in church that live on that same philosophy. They're so busy acting like somebody else, they don't even know who they are. They come in speaking great Christianese. They come in looking good and all that wonderful stuff, but they're no more, they're no more good than a non-productive fig tree. And what did Jesus do to that? He cursed it by the very roots. As a matter of fact, He was saying that any, any tree that does not produce fruit, it said the axe will be laid to the roots. 
So carnal Christians better watch out for double-bitted axes. Because God is not only a God of love, but He is a God of judgment. And He will judge your sin. If you don't judge it, honey, He will. Someone say amen and hallelujah. All right, all right. Well, none of you have walked out yet, so I'm safe. Praise God. Now, all who are governed by the carnal, what does it say here? Will not please God. Saints of God, our number one objective is to please our Heavenly Father. I've mentioned this and I'll mention it again because I really believe it, 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 it bears repeating. We serve the only big G God in this universe. And within the pages of these books, over 2,000 promises to those that say yes and amen. He gives 12 gifts of the Spirit. He also gives nine fruit of the Spirit. Do you notice a giving pattern here? But the carnality side of things demands and takes. Demands and takes. Yeah, it'll, it'll give a little bit to tantalize the flesh, but the flesh pays a terrible price. God constantly blesses and gives, and when He gives, what does He do? He edifies. He equips. He anoints. Glory to God. He uses you in a manner that is so pleasing to Him that you'll walk in blessing so much the Bible says you cannot contain all of it. Oh, come on now, saints of God. That's something to be happy about. There's, there's the shouting part of the message right there in case you missed it. Hallelujah. He wants to bless you to overflowing. Hallelujah. He wants you to walk in anointing. Yes, He does. They can, they can ever be... And they, now listen, carnal people are this way. They're religious. And some of them are even moral. Believe it or not. They're moral. They're cultivated. And some of them are even noble. And they do a lot of good things for people. A lot of good things. I know people that go to church, you know... They'll give out food and they'll give out clothing and they'll give the shirt off of their back. But they're as carnal as can be. You know, it is not that God takes no pleasure in moral action because He does. It helps and benefits people. He really does. And He has called the body to meet the needs and necessities of those that are hurting and suffering to the widows and the orphans. And to all that, the Scripture tells us to do those things. Says if we're going down down the road and, and, and we meet a brother that's broken down or whatever, we walk two miles with them. We take the coat off our back, take the shoes off our feet. And I've done that. I have done that. But none of that counts in the eyes of God unless you're doing it in a spiritual way. When you do these things, you go, look what I did. Hello. Look what I did. Dangerous. It's called the I syndrome. I did this and I did that and I, 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 I. You need to put your eyes away. And say, look what the Lord hath done. That person was healed of cancer, but God. Those people were fed and clothed, but God. The orphan was adopted by a God-fearing family, but God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You see, he cannot take pleasure and accept any kind of carnal worship because that is all designed to purchase his favor. And did you know his favor is not for sale? It's not for sale. Any, nothing about our God is for sale. Nothing. But He will freely give it if you freely give Him your life. Come on now. Mm hmm. That's important. You know, this is mentioned in the Bible. It really is. And we'll get to it here in a minute. Now I'll just give you a sneak peek. God rejected Cain's worship and his offerings. Even though, even though he went to the altar, he built an altar. Come on, somebody. He built an altar. And he even laid a sacrifice on it. I'm going to stop right there. We'll pick up on that in a minute. 
Those that are controlled by the carnal will, and that's just what it is. You see, we're free moral agents. We can either choose to walk in carnality or we can walk in the Spirit. God went out a long way. Oh, I think he went out on a limb when he sat there and gave people free moral agency. But that just goes to prove you just how trustworthy God is. What a giving God he is. He gave us all free moral agency to choose. And aren't you glad that he did? Hallelujah. Because I'll tell you what, you appreciate it more when you realize that you surrendered all. Hallelujah. Because of what he did. And you can savor what you've accepted. Because he'll give you more. He'll give you more. But the carnal that are controlled by a carnal will will set their affections upon what gratifies it. So in other words, it's like a cycle. The, the minute that they go to please their flesh, they have to do it again and do it again and do it again. Why? Because the flesh cries out for attention. Listen, I'm not up here of my own accord. It's the unction of the Holy Ghost because I'd rather be sitting down with y'all. But there's a call of God on my life where He has called me to do His will. And because I walk in the Spirit of Almighty God, I yield myself to that Spirit. And I preach this word knowing that I will stand accountable more so than the one that does not. Divine. Let's talk about divine. I like that word divine. Because it's close to my Father. My Father is divine. It's wonderful. Some of you, some of you uh, guys out there used to refer to your girlfriends as divine. The Father God is the ultimate divine. He desires our intimacy. He desires our fellowship. He desires us to be one-on-one -on -one with Him. And in the days in which we're living right now, you will die if you're not in fellowship with your Father. You will die if you don't allow the Holy Ghost to be a part of your life. And what do I mean you're going to die? You're going to die spiritually. Listen, we're already dying now. Because of Genesis chapter 3, what happened in the garden, we're all dying. The effects of sin are literally wreaking havoc with our bodies. So we got to do what we can do. we got to plow while it's yet day. We have got to be about the Father's business. And the only way we can do it genuinely is to be spiritually minded. Divine, the opposite is true in the case of those controlled by the divine will. <clears throat> Once again, we have God's will. His last will and testament is in my hands right now. Amen. And it should be in yours. Every day you should familiarize yourself with the last will and testament. Because if you do that, then you become more spiritually minded. You see, the flesh, the carnal... We have tendencies and urges. And what's even worse, we are genetically dispositioned with characteristics that have been moved on to us biologically through our parents. And we have to fight that. That's why Paul says, I mortify or I kill or put to death my flesh daily. Mortify. What does that mean, mortify? That's where we get the word mortician. To kill it, to put it away. So that it's not raising havoc or leading us in a way that will kill us spiritually again. See, the one thing that I've understand about the carnal and the spiritual is, is one ends in death and the other one will bring us eternal life. I don't know about you, but I've read the back of the book and I know we win. Hallelujah. There's your chance to shout right there. And we know that we're going to live in a city that's 15 miles, 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide. Glory to God. Got mansions all over inside of there. And the Lamb will be the light and the, 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 the purest gold streets you've ever seen in your life. And the foundations of precious stones. Hallelujah. Can't you wait to get there? I know I'm waiting. This place is going to seem like a ghetto compared to that heavenly city. But I got news for you. God didn't leave this little ball we call earth out of it. He's going to renovate it. He's going to bring it back to its first estate. So that when that, that heavenly Jerusalem comes down out of planet heaven, if you will, and comes down and rests upon this earth in Jerusalem, D.C., David's capital, it'll be right there and that will be the hub of all activity on this earth for eternity, future, forever. 
Hallelujah. And aren't you glad that the dispensational people of grace which we are, the New Testament church. Hello, New Testament church. Do you know that we are going to be the ones that reside in that heavenly city? And all that come after that, well, they're going to reside here on earth. And a lot of preachers don't preach this. The millennial reign. And what happens after the millennial reign. And how the tree of life will be on each side of the river of life. And that river flows from the threshold of God's throne as it talks about in Ezekiel. And it said those leaves will be for the healing of the nations. That they will come and eat that no disease will come on your bodies. Because did you know, and this will blow your mind, do the research, that there will be people that will be all through this process and there will be some that will be in mortal bodies. Check it out. I just blew your theology out of the water. Amen. Check me out. See if I'm right. There's your challenge tonight. The reason why it's foreign to you is because no one teaches and preaches on it. Because no one wants to avail themselves to spiritual truth today. Come on, somebody. You're getting awful quiet on me. It means you're listening. You see, most, most preachers won't get up here and preach on that and teach on that because they know nothing about it. They've not availed themselves to the Scriptures. They've not studied the Word of God as it's commanded to us in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study this book, to relish this book, to literally get inside, crawl inside of these Scriptures and know who, what they are and what He wants us to be. But anyway, moving on. Now let's get on to Cain. Let's get on to Cain. Cain offered a sacrifice. He built the altar. He put a sacrifice on it. But God could not accept it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. One through seven. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just getting some out of this tonight. Amen. Genesis. It's the first book in the New Testament. I'm kidding. Some of you started turning there, didn't you? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Here it is. Genesis chapter 4, 1 through 7 reads this. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And there's another sermon right there. And she began to bore his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought forth the fruit of the ground as an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also brought forth the first thing, firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. You know, people that are carnal get very angry. The world in which we're living in is a very angry world right now. The people that are in the flesh are very angry people right now. Make note of that. Verse 5, But unto Cain and his offering he had no respect, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry? In other words, you know exactly what I was asking for, but yet you did not provide that sacrifice. See, oftentimes we know what God is asking for. But what we'll come in here with our own ideologies and our own programs and our own sacrifices by the works of our hands and our flesh and expect God to have respect for it. He doesn't. He can't. He won't. It's contrary to His Word. Now, if you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do well, sin lies at the door. And unto you shall... Be his desire, and you shall rule over him. Now, the Lord promised Cain dominion over the earth of that day if he would offer up and place his trust with the right sacrifice. But the problem is, we think we can tell God what he's going to accept when we're in the carnal state. And God says no. And what God has to do, what he has to do, is he has to withhold the blessing. 
He has to withhold any of the promises of this book because when we go contrary to the Word, we tie His hands spiritually. And then we wonder why there's not a move of God in the house of God when we have collectively tied His hands. Oh, come on, somebody. This is truth. We need to be about the Father's business We need to be in these scriptures. We need to know His Word so that we can be spiritually minded and walk in unison with the leading of the Holy Ghost. And when we do that, then He'll pour His Spirit out upon all flesh that are obedient unto His Word. Now the Spirit of God is being poured out. It's been poured out since the day of Pentecost, which was prophesied 300, I think it was 20 years before the day of Pentecost in the book of Joel. And it's still being poured out today. But the problem is we're not under the spout where the glory of God's coming out because we've got to find our way there. The Spirit is moving. The Spirit is moving. But the Spirit of God will not stay where He's not wanted. Come on, somebody. He's a gentleman. Now, We say we want the miracles of the book of Acts, but we will not get our act together. When we get our act together and we are spiritually minded, 100% in unison, with unity as it was on the day of Pentecost, honey, I'm telling you, a mighty rushing wind will come through this house and you will be blessed. Hallelujah. You'll be lifted up and edified. And I'm telling you, it'll go outside the walls of this house. And it'll touch the neighborhood around us. It'll touch the confused. It'll touch the unsaved. It'll touch the murderer, the whoremonger, the thief, the adulterer. It'll touch them all. And they'll come pouring in that door. And we better be ready. We better be spiritually minded and equipped and ready to handle those that come in the door. Listen, we've got some churches that have the attitude that if you're not saved, then you're not one of us. You have to understand who we're going after. We're fishing for the unsaved. When the unsaved come in the house, don't expect them to be all saved. Because sinners sin. That's why they're called sinners. They're still carnal. But if we love them and let the Holy Ghost touch them and move on them and convict them, they'll make their way down to this altar. And if we love them through that experience, come on somebody, then they'll mature in two. Come on now. And the thing is, we just can't lead them to the cross and leave them there. We've got to grab a hold of them, put one of them under our arm or two of them, and disciple them and tell them about the spiritual things of God that they may grow into mature Christians. Well, Brother Ron, you don't know how much work that is. Oh, honey, I do. I do. I do it all the time. I disciple young men. I let my wife deal with the women. And as a pair, we have dealt with young girls. As a pair. Come on, somebody. You get what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Now, why didn't God accept it? Because it was a labor of His own hands. We've got to quit laboring for the wrong reasons. Start laboring for the right reasons. Come on now. His actions and sacrifice is that the Holy Spirit refers to as carnally minded. He was carnally minded when He offered the sacrifice. He was carnally minded when he knew full well what God wanted and intended for. Now, let's talk about being spiritually minded. How many would like to be spiritually minded in this house? I didn't see no hands, so okay. Well, there's a few hands. I'm kind of hoping you all were already spiritually minded. It was a trick question. Okay, praise God. Well, you're not throwing nothing at me yet, so I'm okay. Pastor John, I'm okay so far. Larry, you look like you're thinking hard back there. All right. <clears throat> to be spiritually minded means to follow the pattern laid down by the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be living according to Christ and Him crucified. That's the answer to every problem on earth. You see, the thing is, let me find it real quick. I think it's Luke 9, 23, and I didn't give you this verse, sis, but uh, it just came to me. Hallelujah. We'll have to blame the Holy Ghost on that one. There it is. Luke 9, 23. This is important. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. In other words, 
Let him deny his carnality or his flesh and take up his cross and follow me. He's not talking about a wooden beam here. He's talking about following after him in the spirit so that we can walk in the benefits of what he brought us when he hung on that cross. When he said it is finished, it brought all kinds of spiritual benefits to the body of Christ. And if we don't have them in our life, it's our fault. Come on now. All right, now. Being spiritually minded is what one must be successfully to walk after the Spirit. When we are spiritual minded, then we hear the voice of God. Jesus said, my sheep shall know my voice. Why? Because it's an inner voice. The inner voice is provided by the Holy Ghost that took up residency in you when you said yes to Jesus. And us Pentecostals even take it a little bit further. We want that baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Glory to God that endues you with power so that you'll be able to serve Him and continue to be spiritually minded. And if you're struggling, you just start going, you don't have to edit that out to put it on YouTube either. Glory to God. A lot of people edit that out on these videos. Listen, man, I pray in tongues. I believe in it. It endues me with power. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What it does is, is He can pray for me when I don't even know what to pray for. Come on, somebody. When I feel overwhelmed, I just open up my mouth and let Him pray for me. Because I'm spiritually minded enough to know that He will intercede on my behalf as it tells me in Romans. I'm just about finished. Somebody say amen. Well, there's some of you in a rush, aren't there? Okay. Mm-hmm. Modern Christians, and that's who we are today, have some understanding of the cross. But the reason why most don't is because no one's preaching it anymore. What do I mean by that? We want to get into pick and choose theology these days. What pleases the itching ear. You know, the bottom line is, I like a warm fuzzy once in a while too, but it better have some substance to it. It better produce something in my life. Otherwise, I don't need it. It's useless to me. It's trash. Put it in the bag and throw it out. I don't want it. Now, excluding all else and not allowing anything to take the place of Jesus... Is what we need in our life. And what does that bring? It brings salvation. That's what it brings. When we preach the unadulterated word of God, it brings salvation to the hearer. It brings deliverance to the captive. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What it does is it breaks the yoke of bondage in those people that are bound to life. And there's a lot of bound people out there. A lot of unsaved people out there. Thank you, Jesus. I'm on three of ten. I'm kidding. Here we go. But almost none as it regards sanctification. Does anybody know what the word sanctification means? Just raise your hand up if you do. If you don't, don't be embarrassed. Because I'm going to give you the meaning. Okay? To make holy. Because you've got to be holy. In order to please God, you've got to be holy. And He's the only one that can make you that. Set apart is sacred. Oh, glory to God. I like that. I'm set apart. You're set apart. You're set apart. If you're washed in the blood of the Lamb of God and believe in Him, you're set apart. Set apart for what? You're consecrated. You're consecrated to what? To purify. You contain the words of purification when you preach the gospel. You contain the Spirit of God that brings somebody to the cross so that they can be purified. Hallelujah. Washed whiter than snow. Hallelujah. To purify or to be free from sin. Isn't that the goal? To be free from sin. That's the goal. Now, as a, res- as a result, spiritual failure all too often characterizes most of the modern day Christians. What do I mean by that? Even those who try extra hard, they fail. 
And it's because they slip into a carnal state of mind. I've known people that have gone to church for 30, 40 years. They have now slipped into a carnal state of mind. I don't need to go to church. Huh? These were the same people when they first got saved. They were waiting an hour in the parking lot to get in so they'd unlock the door so they could get in and see what God was going to do. I'm telling you, those days are beginning to come back. I believe that if we pray as spiritually minded people, for people to have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, I believe that as we do what we're supposed to be doing, led by the Holy Ghost, and bring these people in, they will understand what we're talking about, what we're living, and they will experience an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, which needs to be soon. And it can only come when we say, God, pour out your spirit. Carnal minded don't care about a move of God, but spiritually minded people do. And we should, and we need to pray for it today. Last page. I'm going to say amen. <clears throat> for those of us that are led of the Spirit, we are sons of God. Let me clarify that for the ladies. Sons also means women too. Just like man in the Bible means mankind. So I don't want nobody getting offended walking in and saying, well, they left, he left the ladies out. No, I included you. Hallelujah. Because you're important too. Amen. Romans 8, 14. Let's go there real quick. Romans 8, 14. I'm looking in my Bible. I know she's going to have it on the screen faster than I can get there. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Mary, for that. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> For as many are as led, are led, are led. Remember that word, led, L-E-D. By the Spirit of God, they are the what? The sons of God. Now, it's important that you know who you are in the family of God. You're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's an important place to be. A joint heir. In other words, also you're led of the Spirit. Those that are carnal could care less about being led anywhere but to tantalize their flesh. To satisfy the needs of their flesh through the compulsions and the urges and the tendencies. But a spiritually minded person doesn't mind being led by the Spirit or pulled by the Spirit. Matter of fact, it talks about when Jesus went into the wilderness, He was led by the Spirit or driven literally by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. None of us like to hear that word tempted. But that's where your faith grows. That's right. In the valley of decision, honey, that's where the test comes. And you'll find out just how firm your faith is and how deep it is. And how much God will honor it. Right. But also how much He'll grow it, too. Come on, somebody. You've got to grow with temptation and, and with uh, patience, too. We don't like to hear that P word either, do we? Let me tell you something. When patience have a perfect work, glory to God, you'll have a, a tendency to have a tenacity, it's a lot of T's, to get through any trial that's coming your way. It's not if you're going to go through it, it's when you're going to go through it and you're going to need these tools. All right, now, notice the word led, L-E-D of the Spirit. The word means to lead. In other words, are we open to be led of the Spirit of God? Are we open to it? When we are led or follow the leading of the Spirit of God, it means we are in in the position to be led or pulled by the Spirit of God. Pulled. Even when you're kind of resistant a little bit, He'll grab a hold of your collar gently and He'll pull you that direction. I know He did one night in October 1984. He pulled me to the altar. And I said yes to Jesus. When we are led... Or we follow the leading of the Spirit of God, it means we are in the will of God. How many want to be in the will of God? Amen. How many should be in the will of God tonight? Yes, come on now. Now, as we are led of God's will, we are being spiritually minded. <clears throat> and if we're spiritually minded, and I'll end on this, what do we have? We have life. And we have peace. We have life and peace. As we live as a child of God, and I'll close on this then. This is my number two closing. 
The child of God will walk in total victory. Amen. Why? Because he said, when it is finished, your victory is right there. You just got to learn to grab it, claim it, and walk in it. With every aspect of our lives, not just a little piece missing here or there, but he covers all of your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For those tonight that say, man, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if I measure up enough. Let me tell you something. The blood of Jesus Christ covers all sin. When the enemy comes and says, you don't measure up or you're not good enough... You know what? I didn't measure up. I wasn't good enough. But guess what he did? When I said yes to Jesus, his blood cleansed me anyway. Hallelujah. And even in this walk today, saints of God, when we mess up, when we trip up, the important thing is, is to get back up and ask of cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Those of you that need prayer tonight, we'll be more than willing to lay hands on you, put some oil on you, and pray for you. It's important that we be spiritually minded these days. Our minds are assaulted every day we go down the road. I don't know how many times when I'm driving, people tell me I'm number one. (laughs) Or they have those wonderful little vinyl stickers on their back window that proclaim their state of mind. Whether it be politics Or whether it just be some stupid message from the pit of hell that assaults and molests my mind. Here I am trying to be spiritual and somebody's got some dumb thing on their back window. Saying some perverse thing or something just plumb stupid. It's all carnal. It's all carnal. Saints of God, I think you'll agree with me. We fight a battle every day. So it's so important that we're spiritually minded. Sister Bernice, you want to play a little music for me? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And I do apologize. We'll sing that song again. First verse is, what are you doing wearing that heavy burden? (laughs) Just came to my mind. Hallelujah. We'll practice it more. Nobody's perfect in this house. Nobody's perfect. So if you're trying to act that way, quit. I had a man tell me one time, he said, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace. I said, well, I'm no longer a sinner, I'm a saint. Quit saying you're a sinner. You have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and you're a saint of God. And you don't have to walk carnally. You don't have to give in to those urges and those tendencies. And you don't have to give in to those genetically positioned little characteristics that are sent down through the bloodline of your family. You can walk in a divine nature. Why? Because the divine nature lives in you. You're spiritually minded now. Those of you that have any doubts about that, we'll pray for you. But if you're washed in the blood of the Lamb of God, and I'll say it one more time, and it bears repeating, if you trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you're walking in that fact every day, then you are spiritually minded. Don't let the enemy come and minister and tell him, tell you that you're not saved. And can I tell you a secret? When he does that, the devil's a what? Time to shut up and get on down the road. When he says you're not saved, you know you are. You're saved. Your messages like this are not popular in every arena in Christian arenas anymore. What a sad day that is. A lot of ministers will not give preachers a license or the freedom to get up here and preach a message like this. Listen. This message wasn't a shout-me-down message in some parts, but it was an educational message to let you know just where you are in Christ Jesus. We need to know these things, church. And we need to act accordingly. 
You are my family. By the blood of Jesus Christ, you're my family. Every proclivity or problem, everything you're going through is important to me. Just as I ask you to pray for my family as we're going through a whole lot of stuff right now. I can take confidence in knowing that blood-bought believers that are spiritually minded are going to their places of prayer and their altars in their home and are praying for us. And know this, we're doing the same for you. Why? Because we love you. Altars are open right now for you just to pray or if you need us to pray for you, we'll do just that. But for those who need to go, I'm going to dismiss you right now. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you tonight for the unction to function. And we thank you for the privilege to get behind the sacred desk one more time. God, we don't take that lightly, but we take it with such respect. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for our pastors. I thank you, Father God, that you're protecting them, that you put a hedge about them over every aspect of their life as they run and try to be the best under shepherds of this house of worship that they can. And all the saints would agree and say, Amen.